Hey, wherever you are, thanks for joining us online for a New Life Church sermon. We believe the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. We hope this message is a blessing to you today. Okay, uh, if you brought your Bible, go ahead, turn to Matthew 9, uh, verse 27. So we're going to be for the most part of this morning. And while you're turning there, uh, I just want to give us kind of some, some context or maybe focus our attention uh, to what we're going to be talking about this morning. So in this chapter of the Bible, in Matthew 9, okay, there are four accounts of Jesus healing someone uh, in response to faith, specifically in response to faith, okay? He makes a paralyzed man walk. He raises a little girl from the dead. He cures a woman of uh, un- uncontrollable bleeding. She had a condition, 12 years, an issue of blood for 12 years. Doctors couldn't figure it out. She touches just the edge of Jesus' robe, and she's instantly healed, okay? And then finally, he gives two blind men their sight. All of this happens in one chapter, okay? And at every instance, at every healing, uh, faith is identified as the essential component. And you're like... That's kind of weird. Why is faith the essential component? Shouldn't it be, I don't know, the power of God, uh, the Holy Spirit? Uh, again, the fact that Jesus is God in the form of a man. Absolutely, he is the one that healed them. Uh, but he is the one that also identifies their faith as the essential component. And so you, you read things in this chapter like seeing their faith. Jesus spoke and uh, called the young man to get up and walk. You see things like uh, him saying to the woman that he healed with the issue of blood, your faith has made you well. Uh, You see that after he removes a crowd of people that are uh, ridiculing him and mocking him, uh, he gets them out of the room uh, for their, because of their unbelief, he gets them out of the room. And as soon as he gets the unbelieving crowd out of the room, he raises a girl from the dead. And uh, lastly, uh, we get to our two blind men. And, I, and I'm going to go ahead and tell the story of the two blind men a little bit because there's a lot in there. So starting in uh, verse 27, uh, we see these blind men. Jesus is walking along a road and there's, crowd, there's a crowd following him. There's, there was a crowd everywhere Jesus went. And in the crowd, there are these two men. They're blind. They cannot see um, and they're stumbling after him. They're, they're leaning on people, and, they're, and they're, they're stubbing their toe in rocks and stuff, and they're doing everything they can just to keep up, and they're crying out to him, Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, one thing you need to know is that them calling him Son of David was a declaration that they believed he was the Messiah, Because when Jesus was on the earth, not everybody believed he was the Messiah. But these two men, they did. They believed he was the son of God. Calling him son of David was effectively calling him the son of God. Because that's what he was, that's what the prophecies, uh, the prophecies referred to him as. So they're calling out to him, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus continues walking. He makes his way into a house. They follow him into the house. Okay, they've got to ask people where to go, follow directions, hope nobody's messing with them. They got to feel their way around and they got to listen and tune in. And finally, they make their way into the house. It says in verse 28, they went into the house where he was staying. And Jesus asked them, Jesus asked them, do you believe I can make you see? Do you believe that I can make you see? They said, yes, Lord, we do. And it says, then he touched their eyes. And this is what he said. Because of your faith, it will happen. Because of your faith, it will happen. It says that their eyes were opened and they could see. And that Jesus warned them not to tell anybody. But they couldn't help it. They told everyone, which is awesome. Okay, so uh, another translation says, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And that's our main scripture this morning is that verse 27, uh, depending on the translation you're reading, either it may say, according to your faith, let it be done to you, or it may say, because of your faith, it will happen. He's saying the same thing. He's 
crediting them for their faith. Now, again, we know it was the power of God that healed them, but Jesus himself chooses to highlight their faith. Why is that? Well, God's trying to communicate something to us, especially because this same theme is repeated four times in just one chapter. Same theme, four times, one chapter. I think he might be trying to tell us something, okay? God is trying to tell us something about how his kingdom works. And he's really trying to make sure that we get it, that like, no matter what your reading level is, no matter what score you got on the SAT, you are gonna understand that faith is an essential component in the kingdom of God. And so this is our focus today. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. It says the activity of God in our lives happens in direct proportion to our faith. The activity of God in our lives happens in direct proportion to our faith. Basically, where there is faith, God can move. Where there isn't faith, He can't. And I know what you might be thinking, but he's God. He can do anything. Absolutely, he can. But he is committed to releasing his kingdom on earth in a certain way according to his values. And this is one of his values. So it's less to say that he can't, more to say that he won't. Where there is faith, God can move. Where there is not, he won't. Okay? Uh, that's true in, a, in any given area of a person's life. With these blind men, Jesus asked them, do you believe I can do this for you? Do you believe I can do this for you? Do you believe I can, uh, I can, I can intervene in this area of your life? Obviously, they say yes. He touches their eyes, heals them. Uh, this principle, though, is also true geographically. We see in the Bible that when Jesus visited his hometown, He couldn't do any miracles. That's what the Bible says, that he could do no miracles. In fact, it goes, it takes a step further. It says that Jesus marveled at their lack of faith. He marveled at their unbelief. He was dang near impressed by it. He couldn't believe it, how little faith they had. And so he's, he was able to do very few miracles. Here's the thing. They had sick people there. They just didn't have faith. God does not respond to our need. He responds to our faith. He's aware of our need. He's tuned into our our needs. He knows about them, but he doesn't respond to need. He responds to faith. And a lot of people have a lot of different, you know, perspectives on this. There's whole theologies built around what's the relationship between what we do and what God does in a, to, to bring about a certain outcome. And how about for just this morning, we only look at what the Bible says. Does that sound good? Okay. And so again, uh, the activity of God in our lives happens in direct proportion to our faith. It's not how bad we need it. It's how much we believe it. And I know that's cheesy. I know it sounds like a bumper sticker and a t-shirt, but things can be cheesy and true at the same time. This happens to be the case, okay? Now, in order to move forward, we've got to define faith. What is faith? It's this word that we throw around in church and honestly, even in the world. We talk about faith a lot, but we don't really put a definition to it very often. So I want to define faith for us. And there's more than one way to define faith. These are just a few ways, okay? Uh, Hebrews 11 says, Faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. So faith is being certain of the things that we're hoping for, being certain that it's going to happen, being certain that it's going to come to pass, being certain that we'll see it. And it doesn't need to see it first to believe that it'll happen. Faith doesn't have to see to believe. Uh, Another definition of faith, and again, for my note takers in the room, if you want to write this down, faith is giving God permission to do what he already wants to do. God has a will for all of humanity, and he has a will for your life, 
and he wants to accomplish it really, really bad, but he won't violate your freedom to accomplish his will. He needs us to partner with him. He requires that we partner with him. And so faith, again, does he need our permission? No, but he's committed to it. Faith is giving God permission to do what he already wants to do. In uh, Luke 138, whenever the angel comes to the Virgin Mary and appears to her and says, hey, you're going to have a son. And she's like, but I haven't been with the man. And he's like, but you're going to have a son. And he's going to be conceived, and he's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the Savior of the world. He's going to deliver Israel from their sins. Her response is, let it be done to me according to your word. In other words, go ahead. She gave the Lord permission. He, he told her what was going to happen, but she responded in faith, and she said, let it be done to me according to your word. Go ahead and do it. And then she conceived supernaturally she conceived Jesus now sometimes maybe oftentimes we get the impression that God doesn't want to intervene that he's not interested in our personal situation that he doesn't want to heal us or he doesn't want to heal our loved ones that he doesn't want to provide for us or maybe he wants to but he's just not all that motivated or that he doesn't want to change that person's heart. Or that he doesn't want to heal your emotions or your mental health, right? It can feel like that sometimes. I can even admit sometimes it can feel like, for me, I'm kind of bothering him. He's got bigger fish to fry. He's got other stuff to worry about. And so, and so maybe I, you know, maybe he, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to move. But that's not true. Faith is giving him permission to do what he already wants to do. In the case of these two blind men, the healing wasn't even their idea. So we think that, man, God doesn't want to do this, but maybe if I can twist his arm, if I can pray really, really hard, or if I can believe really, really hard, or if I can repeat these words enough times that then I'll see a breakthrough. Then he'll move. Then he'll respond. Then I'll see him or I'll feel his presence or I'll, I'll experience some sort of change of outcome. And the reality is we don't have to twist God's arm. I feel like somebody this morning needs to hear that. You don't have to twist God's arm. He already wants to do it. We just got to give him permission with our faith. So again, with these blind men, yeah, they came to Jesus. Yes, they were asking for mercy, but they didn't say anything about healing. Jesus was the one that brought up healing. Jesus was the one that spoke to them and said, do you believe that I can make you see? He put the ball in their court. It was his idea. And it was just their response. Yes, we do. That again led to him saying, according to your faith, let it be done unto you or because of your faith. This will happen. All they had to do was give him permission. Faith is taking God at his word. Uh, there's this pastor that I really like. His name is Tony Evans. I don't know if anybody's heard of him. He's, he's up in, oh, okay. Some people like Tony Evans. Uh, he's up around my neck of the woods. I'm from Irving, Texas. He's in Oak Cliff, Texas. Um, and so uh, I, don't, I didn't come from like the best neighborhood, but then you look at Oak Cliff and you're like, okay, well, I can't necessarily say I'm from the hood because of Oak Cliff. And if you're from Oak Cliff, I'm sorry, but I also feel like you know what I'm talking about. So, you know, there's that. Anyway, Tony Evans, he pastors a church in Dallas in the Oak Cliff neighborhood, and he's a wonderful man of God. Here's what he, uh, this is a quote from him. He said, Christianity is not for those who believe in God. Christianity is for those who believe God. Christianity is for those who take him at his word. That's what faith is. Faith is agreeing with what his word says, what it says about him, what it says about you, and then expecting what his word says to line up with your personal experience. God, if I see it in the Bible, I better see it in my life. And it's not that we're approaching him, you know, like we're God and he's not, but that's what faith does. 
it's urgent. It's demanding a little bit. And it's fully expectant. It says, Lord, I trust you. I'm not going to be moved by these circumstances. I'm not going to be moved by my feelings. I'm not going to be moved by the opinions of other people. I'm going to believe you and you alone. So one last definition of faith. The gospel uh, of Matthew, it was, it's in the New Testament. Um, the New Testament was written in Greek. And we, tra- we had it translated to English, but it was originally written in Greek. And the Greek word that gets translated to faith in our English translations uh, is the Greek word pistis. It's the Greek word. Everybody just say this with me. Pistis. It's, that's kind of a nice sound. Um, so anyway, uh, the Greek word pistis, it's translated to faith. And the, that word pistis comes from the word patho or paetho. I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced, but it's P-I-E-T-H-O. And that word patho or paetho means to be persuaded. To be persuaded. Or more literally, it means to go from not trusting to trusting. To go from not trusting to trusting. Faith, that word that's used for faith in the Bible, it's speaking to this idea of being persuaded that this doesn't have to be your default setting. It, God's not expecting us to just automatically be in faith. No, faith is being persuaded. Faith is going from not trusting to trusting. It's making the switch from not trusting God to trusting God. So in Ephesians 2, where it says uh, that we're saved by grace through faith, right? Ephesians 2 says, We're saved. Our salvation is a gift of God's grace and it's received through faith. The faith that it's talking about is repentance. Turning from not trusting God to trusting God. Turning from sin to obedience. Trusting God for the forgiveness of our sins, but also trusting his leadership for our lives. Again, I'm just, I'm trying to bring clarity to the, to the word faith because, again, we throw it around a lot, but it can be difficult to apply when we don't have any sort of practical definition. And this one is probably my favorite definition of faith, that to have faith is to let God persuade you. Every single one of us here has a need Every single one of us, we have a need. We might need healing for our bodies. Uh, we might have a, a physical issue. We might have a, a, a mental issue, emotional issue. We may struggle with anxiety or depression. Uh, we may struggle with an all too familiar sin. We all came here today. We're in this room because we need something from the Lord. Our need may be that we don't know where we're going to go when we die. Like you're, you're sitting there and, and if I was reading your thoughts, it, I could almost translate them. Pastor, this all sounds good, but I'm worried that if I don't wake up tomorrow, I don't know where I'm going. We all have a need. So the question is, how do we let God persuade us to give him permission to do what he already wants to do? Because again, He wants to heal. He wants to rescue us from sin. Some of us, we think that he's wagging his finger at us and he's going, I can't believe you messed up again. And he's going, no, come to me. I have the solution. Respond. Don't be stuck in shame. Don't let your pride keep you from receiving what I have for you. He wants to rescue us from sin. He wants to bring peace where there's anxiety where there's fear of the future. He wants to bring joy where there's depression, where we've just been walking around with a dark cloud over us for the past couple days or months or weeks or maybe even years. And right now in this moment, he wants to replace it with joy. It was supernatural joy, what the Bible calls fullness of joy that the world can't offer. He wants to bring freedom. 
He's in the business of it, and he wants to give us eternal life. The Father is willing that none should perish. He's willing that none should perish. God wants everyone to spend eternity with him. That's his will. So how do we let him persuade us? How do we let him get us to give him permission? Well, we have to start with his word. We have to start with the word. And I, I guess that's like my, my first point, again, for the note takers. Do the word. Like how I only put one word up there. Mm, I thought it was clever. Okay. Um, guys, here's what Romans 10, 17 says. Uh, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. If we want to see our faith grow, and again, all of us have a need. God doesn't respond to need. He responds to faith. So the issue isn't whether or not we have a need. The issue is whether or not we have faith. It doesn't matter the amount. There's no chart. Jesus said, faith of a mustard seed. Move mountains, right? But it's not something we can get, our, get on our own. So if we want to see our faith grow, if we want to see it actually bring about change, if we want to partner with God to experience everything that he's promised with us, uh, we have to interact with his word. And notice I say interact with. So I'm not saying that you got to go leave today and go memorize all of Romans. That'd be cool, but I'm not saying you have to do it. I'm not saying you've got to uh, spend hours rigorously studying. If, that, if that's not where you're at, that's not where you're at. I'm just saying interact with it. Buy a coffee mug with a Bible first on it. Just something, okay? We have to interact with his word. It's the only way. It's the only way. Here's what Psalms 119 says about God's word. That it revives us. It gives us life. It expands our understanding. It keeps us from lying to ourselves. How many of us need that? Right? It turns our eyes from worthless things. Man, hello, three hours on TikTok a day. It turns our eyes from worthless things. That one hurt. That, one, what, that one's supposed to hurt. I'm sorry if that hurt. Well, no, I'm not. Um, Bible says that his word helps us abandon shameful ways, keeps us from stumbling, causes us to walk in freedom, gives us great peace, gives light so that even the simple can understand. Thank you, Lord. Even us simple people can understand. And it's by interacting with his word that faith increases. So this point is like super simple. Uh, any way you can interact with God's word. Read the word. Read your Bible. Again, you don't got to memorize Romans. But start with a verse. Start somewhere. Read your Bible. Get your eyes on your Bible and tell me nothing changes. Just watch. Okay. Got to get your eyes in your Bible. Listen to the word. You know, you can literally play the Bible in your car through the Bible app. It will read to you. You just hit a play button. I love it. And sometimes I zone out, but then I come back and I'm like, oh man, that's so good. Thank you, Lord. And sometimes I got to hit the, you know, back 15 seconds button a few times. But the fact of the matter is I'm interacting with his word. Okay. Uh, man, Bible app, find a sermon on YouTube, we have more access to biblical content than we've ever had in the history of humanity. There's people in China that they're living off of a, like, a, like a one page of the Bible torn out. And they just read that over and over and over again. And it builds their faith over and over and over again. And they withstand persecution. And they're praying for people and watching them healed. And they're seeing people come to Jesus by the hundreds of thousands. That's the power of his word. Just a scrap of paper. And we have the internet. <laughs> okay. Speak the word. Incorporate God's word into your conversations. I say this in, in all love. Seriously, I love each and every one of you. Uh, stop giving people uh, fortune cookie advice. Even if your mom said it or grandmama said it, I, I'm sure she's a lovely woman. Uh, but we got to stop. We got to get back to the word, you guys. We got to get back to the word. We got to just stop regurgitating talking points, okay, that we see on the news or Turning Point USA 
or what have you, or just on social media posts, okay? If you're going to speak something, let it be the Word of God. Watch your faith grow. Watch the activity of God in your life grow. This is a promise. It's not, I'm not making suggestions. This is a promise. Pray the Word. Pray the word. Here's how I like to think about it. God has already told us what, we wanted, what he wants to do. We don't have to try to guess what his will is. We, we have his word. He's already told it to us. He's already made it available to us. He's already told us what he wants to do in my life, in your life, in this city, in this nation, in this world. Now just say it back to him. Just say it back to him. You don't have to get creative when you pray. It doesn't have to be long or poetic or whatever. If you don't know what to pray, just pray the Bible. Just find a verse and start praying. And as you're praying, just use the words that are in the scriptures. It's powerful uh, when you pray. He's given us the words. Say it back to him. Uh, sing the word. There's something special about singing, especially if you can't sing. Because it's so vulnerable. I mean, when I'm in my living room and I'm belting at the top of my lungs and it's ugly, it's like there's no pride, there's no shame, there's no selfish ambition. It's just me and the Lord. I never get more vulnerable with the Lord than when I sing his word. And you know, the Bible actually commands us uh, 50 times in the Bible, we're commanded to sing. Commanded to sing. It's not negotiable. So even my manly men, my dudes, just do it. This is a faith thing, okay? Just trust, all right? Uh, and, and, we, and here's the thing. We got to disregard our preferences. Uh, what, what pastor you like, what preacher you like, what mu- your flavor of music or, or whatnot. It, look, it's not about, enter- this is not entertainment, okay? This is about getting the word in us, letting it persuade us, Uh, and then uh, allowing that to move our hearts so that, again, you and me can give God permission to do what he already wants to do. Amen? Awesome. Okay. Uh, I believe this. It sounds weird, okay, but you singing can have a role to play in your body getting healed. Your choice to sing. You spending the, the, the extra 15 minutes that was going to go to fantasy football um, and taking that and just reading your daily devotional, that can have a hand in determining whether or not you get free from lust. It's not because it depends on us, guys. It's because God's activity is in direct proportion to our faith Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Oh, that was, I'm sorry, guys. That was kind of weak. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by. All right, you're with me. Good. All right. Uh, Here's the the last point, again, for my note takers. Uh, Faith is imparted by the Holy Spirit. Faith is imparted by the Holy Spirit. Here's what Galatians 5.22 says. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Faithfulness is how it's translated, but it's the same word. It's that word pistis, the word for faith. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Faith, in other words, is a natural byproduct of the Holy Spirit's uh, influence in your life over time. For any believer, anyone that's been born again, uh, hopefully as the Holy Spirit begins to have more and more influence in your life, your faith just naturally increases. It's a byproduct from his uh, uh, presence in your life. And I feel like I got a word for somebody. Uh, if you are in a crisis of faith, like you've got a big need and you've got no faith and you don't see a way out, I plead with you, I plead with you. If there is anything in your life that you know is grieving the Holy Spirit, remove it. Remove it. 
even if it's not necessarily sin, if there's anything in your life that you know is grieving the Holy Spirit, remove it. Cut it out. It's taking up excess room. He's cramped. We, he wants to fill our whole house, and we're giving him like a cabinet in the kitchen. He needs more room. If we need our faith to grow, we got to give the Holy Spirit more room to produce that fruit. And so if there's anything in your life, whether it's content that you're taking in, whether it's movies or television or music or it's just the way that you're talking or even some of the people that you're around, take a break from them for a little bit. I'm not saying completely disown. I'm saying take a break from them for a little bit and let the Holy Spirit, we got to stop grieving the Holy Spirit because if we allow him, uh, if, we, if we give him that room in our lives, we'll see our faith grow and we will see the breakthrough. Uh, there's another way that the Holy Spirit imparts his faith, imparts faith to us. Uh, it's a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's fruit of the Spirit, but it's also a gift of the Holy Spirit uh, that can be received in a moment. It's, it's as if God, in a, in a single moment in time, in a crisis or the, the hour of great need, he, it's like he loans us his faith. It's like the Holy Spirit loans us his faith where he gives us the ability supernaturally to believe what he believes, to believe uh, what's, imp- what's possible. Uh, we believe what he believes is possible, which is beautiful because the Holy Spirit believes that anything is possible for God. He has complete faith, zero doubt. And there's moments in our lives where God will download that kind of faith in, a, in an hour of need uh, when we cry out to him and he'll empower us with the faith that we need to move that mountain, whatever it may be. Um, so here at New Life, we like to respond to the message uh, in real time. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, if God is speaking to you, and you feel the need to respond in some way, uh, we like to provide that opportunity in the service. And so you see the band is coming back up, and uh, we're going to go through a couple more songs of worship like we did at the beginning. The communion tables are going to be open to receive the elements, okay? And uh, and um, we're going to have an opportunity to respond. And so uh, we're going to go into that time in a second. Uh, in fact, let's just do this. Let's just stand. Let's, can we stand? We'll go into that time now. It's the last thing I, that uh, I'm going to share. I just feel the need to, to speak on this. So there is, there's a growing trend in this generation, in my generation. Uh, it's called uh, manifesting. I don't know if you've heard of it, but basically it's where uh, if you want something really, really bad, you think about it a lot, uh, you speak it, you write it down, you put out positivity into the universe, and then you'll receive what you're hoping for. No. (laughs) Uh, This sounds like faith. It sounds really good, so I can't even fault you for clapping. That sounds really, really good. Here's where it is deceptive. Manifesting requires one, uh, you get to determine what's of value. It's whatever you want. So in this case, you're God. God's not God in manifesting. Uh, The other thing is manifesting asks nothing of you. Faith requires a whole lot. Manifest, you just think about it and whatever, and it comes to you. And so honestly, at best, it's, it's like a, it's a, cruel prank at worst you may be partnering with demonic spirits so I warn you against it I warn you against partaking in this practice while there are some similarities between this and faith uh, there's one crucial difference and that is that faith requires action faith requires action and that action 
is expressed through obedience to God. Now there's all kinds of obedience. There's sometimes obedience just looks like discipline. Just saying no to things that are bad for us or that we want to do, but we know it's destructive to our soul. Uh, but there's a specific kind of obedience kind of action that I want to key in on. And that's this. Um, faith, obedience rooted in faith is expressed through risk. It's expressed through laying down your own preferences, laying down your comfort, laying down what makes sense to you, laying down your own will and taking up God's will for your life. It takes risk. There's this story about a man that used to uh, gather crowds around um, uh, Niagara Falls and he would set up a tightrope and he would walk across the tightrope carrying a, a wheelbarrow. And before he would go, he would ask the crowd, uh, how many people think that I can do this? And like two people would put their hands up, so not the majority of people. And then he'd walk across uh, with the wheelbarrow and he'd come back successfully. And people would cheer, they'd go crazy. And then he would say, how many of y'all think I can do it again? And everybody raised their hands, right? They saw it. They know he's good for it. And then he would ask, who wants to get in the barrel? All hands go down. You hear what I'm saying? Faith requires risk. It requires getting in the wheelbarrow. We have to take risk. We have to take a step. It requires action. We have to take a step in order to experience this impartation of faith. And guys, we need this impartation of faith. Our nation needs this impartation of faith. This next generation needs believers that have a special supernatural impartation of faith. Your family needs you to receive a special impartation of faith. We need it. As we continue into the end days, as the end of the age and the world gets crazier and Christianity, uh, it already is in the other parts of the world, but America, there's more hostility towards Christians. We need a supernatural impartation of faith to make it to the end. And so I want to invite you to receive that impartation of faith. Here's what we're going to do. We're just going to, uh, if you want this, if you need to receive supernatural faith from the Lord for your situation, whether it's for your family, your marriage, uh, getting free from sin, whatever it may be. Maybe you need to receive salvation. I wanna invite you to come up to the front, take a step, and we're, gonna, uh, we're all gonna pray together and we're gonna ask God to pour His Spirit out on us. And according to His Word, we're gonna ask Him to impart that supernatural faith by His Holy Spirit. And so, we may have the need, but the need's not enough. We gotta respond. Okay, so I'm actually opening up right now. If you wanna respond to this, if you wanna come, we'll pray together. I wanna invite you to come to the front right now. Uh, make your way outside of the row. Come to the front of the stage. Uh, you can kneel, you can stand, whatever you need to do, but I wanna invite you to come forward right now. We're gonna pray and we're just gonna seek God for this. We're just gonna believe God for this. And uh, as the Holy Spirit comes and as He imparts His faith to us, um, I just want us to, you know, if, uh, if you feel led, let's do what we talked about. Let's, say, let's speak the Word. Let's sing the Word as the band leads us. Let's declare the Word over our lives. But if you want to just, if you need this for your life right now, if you want to receive it, I just want you, let's, treat, let's do this. Uh, eyes closed, palms up like we're receiving something. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, our enemy is too much for us. That sin that we've been dealing with, it's too much for us, God. The sickness that's touched our bodies or our loved one's bodies, it's too much for us, God. That struggle in our mind, it's too much for us, God. We're not smart enough, Lord. We're not strong enough, Lord. So we say, Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on me. 
Have mercy on our weakness. Have mercy on our unbelief. Give us the faith that we need, Lord. The faith that only comes from you. The faith that the world can't replicate. The faith that moves mountains. The faith that brings chains. The the faith that heals eyes, Lord. The faith that raises people from the dead. We need a resurrection in this nation. Lord, let it be done according to us. Let it be done to us according to your word. Fill us with faith right now. Fill us with faith right now. Guys, as the band plays, let's just sing out. Let's declare with one voice. God, you're faithful. You're good. Lord, we trust you. If we didn't trust you when we walked in, we're going to trust you walking out, Lord. Come and have your way in Jesus' name. Thanks so much for watching online. Don't forget to follow us on social media at New Life Corpus. And we'd love for y'all to join us on Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. We love you all and God bless.